computer. All right, so hello everyone. I am Liz Ryan. I'm the adult programming coordinator at the Dairy Public Library and welcome on this Saturday afternoon for uh, the very timely program, The History of the New Hampshire Primary. Um, I know with 2020, it's been quite a year and it's hard to believe that less than a year ago, it was literally this year, about a month and a half before COVID really hit, we had the New Hampshire primary um, in early February. So it's, again, hard to believe that was literally this year with everything else that's happened. Um, so I figured um, since the general election is coming up, what better way to, you know, kind of celebrate it with which is going back to where it all began and the honor that our state has in terms of being the first primary in the United States. And with that, I will um, hand it over to John and I'm going to give him the hosting duties. Okay, so I'm officially on deal here as the host. Hi, and thank you for uh, joining us. Um, so let me first of all say, um, put, I'm not John and Lisa, I'm just John. Lisa is my partner, but at any rate, um, why am I doing this? <laughs> How did I get started doing this? So back in the 1980s, after uh, I, I was contacted by a friend here in Concord named Charles Brereton, uh, Chuck had written a book about the history of the New Hampshire primary and is probably one of the best historians of the primary that, at the time. And he hadn't published the book and wanted to know if I'd be interested in maybe producing a documentary history of the primary using his research and him being the research consultant. And so we proceeded ahead to produce a documentary about the history of the New Hampshire presidential primary, which at that point in time, there had not been anything like that. Um, and we used Chuck's book as the basis and it covered the primaries from the very beginning up to the 1984 primary. And then um, you know, a little after the 2000 primary, we got approached by the New Hampshire Political Library asking if we'd be interested in updating our primary documentary. So we, we did, and we um, added 80, 1988, 92, 96, and 2000, uh, pretty much in the same format and style that we did the first one in. And the way we approached it was we weren't interested in talking to presidential candidates. We weren't interested in talking to the people in Washington that, make, that, that, that come up here. We wanted to know how the people on the ground here in New Hampshire were involved and what their experiences were with the primary. And so that's how we approached it. At any rate, um, the documentary was finished. The first one was uh, finished in 1986 or 87. Um, and therefore I became something of a person with some knowledge of the presidential primary. Chuck actually passed away a, few, a couple of years ago and so he's no longer around. Uh, he did write a second book on the history of the primary as well. So that being establishing my uh, credentials, so to speak, um, let's talk about how the primary came to be. So New Hampshire primaries uh, or primary elections actually have their, res uh, their origin back in the early part of the 20th century um, in the progressive era. The progressive era produced lots of new ideas and, and, and primary elections was one of them because at that time it was not uncommon for political leaders to, uh, to, to be chosen in the smoky back rooms of hotels or, or the Boston and Maine Railroad Station here in New Hampshire. Um, and the people were really not very much a part of that process. And so primary elections were a way of changing that so that we, we opened up that process of selecting who the candidates would be for each particular party through a pre-election or a primary election. Um, the very first primary uh, presidential primary was held in Wisconsin. And if you know a little bit about uh, history, um, you'll know that Robert La Follette, who was one of the leaders of the progressive movement, was also from Wisconsin. And therefore, we have that connection with Robert La Follette. Um, by 1912, there were uh, 12 states holding presidential primaries around the country. Uh, and this was starting to expand. So there was a progressive movement here in New Hampshire. Um, its leaders, there were really the two leaders of the progressive movement in New Hampshire were Robert P. Bass, who was a, uh, from over in Peterborough, and a man named Winston Churchill. And 
most people think of Winston Churchill as this guy from over in England during World War II. But there was another Winston Churchill who was a writer who lived in Cornish, New Hampshire. And he was one of the most popular and well-known writers in America back at the beginning part of, our, this century, of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote a couple of pieces on New Hampshire politics along the way. One of them, his most famous book, is a book called Coniston, which is all about the New Hampshire legislature. And um, Coniston was a, a pseudonym for Croydon, New Hampshire. At any rate, if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to look up Winston Churchill. He was quite an interesting character. Um, and and uh, just an aside story about Winston Churchill was that in the early part of the century, the other Winston Churchill wrote a book. When his first book came out, um, the publisher approached the New Hampshire Winston Churchill's publisher and said, hey, maybe we should do a joint tour of the two Winston Churchills traveling around the country promoting their book. And Winston Churchill of Cornish said, well, I'm not really interested in helping this guy who I don't know anything about over in England and, and kind of poo-poo the idea. And so it never happened. Now, the aside to that, is that Winston Churchill in Cornish died in 1947. So that he actually lived long enough to see his fame really demolished by the Winston Churchill in England, uh, which is kind of a sad thing when you think about it. But at any rate, so in 1912, 1910, Robert P. Bass was elected governor of New Hampshire and proceeded to implement a progressive uh, agenda. They created a state primary, but were not able to get enough votes to have a Republican primary. I'm sorry, a presidential primary. So in 1912, um, and in part because of the split within the Republican Party because of the Bull Moose Party with Teddy Roosevelt, um, there was also a split in the Republican Party here in New Hampshire, and Democrats took control of the state house, both houses of the, uh, the legislature and the governorship. And the Democrats created the New Hampshire primary bill in 1913. They passed a bill that would call for the primary election to be held the third Tuesday of May. Well, the next primary was gonna be in 1916, and uh, two years later, the legislature looked at that date again, and people started saying, well, well, maybe if we move it to town meeting day, we can save ourselves some money, and we'll just have one election rather than two. So the legislature in 1915 voted to change the date of the election, the primary election from May to March, the second, uh, the second Tuesday in March, which was town meeting day. So in 1916, New Hampshire held its first presidential primary. Now, in 1916, Indiana had a primary the week before. And in 1916, Minnesota, am I right? Now, Minnesota had a primary on the same day. So we were not the first, and in some ways we were just uh, tied for second. But before 1920, Indiana decided to move its primary to 19, I'm sorry, Indiana decided to move its primary to May, and Minnesota changed from a primary to a caucus. So that simply by those two acts in 1920, New Hampshire was the first in the nation presidential primary. So if you look at birthdays for the primary, the first would be when it was created in 1913, the second would be when we had our first presidential primary in 1916, and the third would be when we had the first, we were first in the nation in 1920. So in, in effect, the 2020 New Hampshire primary was the very first, uh, or the, the 100th anniversary of the New Hampshire presidential primary. So, but that's not really the primary as we know it. So I'm gonna to try to switch here. We're gonna see here, I'm gonna bring up a ballot for the 1920. See if we can do this. Uh, looks like there it is. Bear with me as we go through these little things. All right, is that up in screen? Everybody see the ballot? Okay, I see Liz shaking her head there. So we're gonna go. So there's the ballot. And I know that you're all on mute, but you can unmute for a minute if you wanna throw something out or have any questions. I hope it's fine to interrupt me. Um, but take a look at the ballot and there's something missing from that ballot. And this is the 1920 ballot uh, for the presidential primary. Anybody wanna, can anybody see what's missing? We'll give you a five seconds, one, two, three, four, five. 
there's no names of presidential candidates on the ballot. What the names are, or you see up there in the top left, delegate at large, vote for four, and then they said alternate delegate. You voted for delegates to go to the national conventions. Now, in some instances, you'll see, for instance, John H. Bartlett was pledged to vote in nom for the nomination of Leonard Wood for president. But in most instances, they didn't even have that. You know, New Hampshire is a small state and our towns are small and you knew who somebody was going to vote for. You might have known who Merrill Shirtliff was going to vote for. So that, but there were no names of presidential candidates on the ballot. It was just the delegates to the convention. Um, now, just, uh, just for, uh, let's take a look at that ballot because you can all see it. Tell me if there's any names that you recognize on the ballot there, because it's fun to see the connections in New Hampshire's history. Uh, anybody recognize Charles Toby? Charles Toby was, uh, at this point in time, he hadn't served anything, but Charles Toby was elected congressman from the second congressional district, and then he was elected governor of New Hampshire, and then he went on to be in the United States Senate. There's only two people in the 20th century that held those three positions, Charles Toby and Judd Gregg. Um, now you see next door over there in the alternate, you see John G. Winant. Maybe some of you have heard of John Winant. Uh, we have a new statue for John Winant here in Concord, uh, right in front of the New Hampshire State Library. John Winant served as governor three terms, uh, governor of New Hampshire. He went on to be the director of the, the first director of the Social Security Administration under Theodore Roosevelt, I'm sorry, under Franklin Roosevelt. And then Roosevelt appointed John Winant to be the ambassador to Great Britain in World War II. And John Winant was really the most famous American to the people in Britain during all that time. He was their support. He was their, he was America's person on the street. In, 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 in England during the war. Um, and people were so, so thankful for him. Uh, the sad side about John Wynant is he came home. He didn't know what he was gonna do next. In 1947, he wrote a book. And when they called at the railroad station in Concord here to say, hey, Mr. Wynant, your, your books have arrived. You know, Pendleton's here at the station. He went upstairs into his bedroom and committed suicide. And that was the end of John Wynant. And because of that suicide, he really became a, um, people didn't know how to process that. And so he wasn't as celebrated as some other past New Hampshire governors until recently. Finally, the last name I draw attention to is Frank Knox, who's the second from the bottom on the left-hand side. Anybody perk up there and know who Frank Knox was? Frank Knox was a rough rider, rode with Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders and the, up San Juan Hill. And because of that fact, he was an incredibly ambitious and, and, and supportive of anything Theodore Roosevelt did. And he moved to New Hampshire in 1912 to start a newspaper with the express purpose of promoting the election of Theodore Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party in the 1912 election. And that newspaper was the Manchester Union. I'm sorry, the Manchester Evening Leader. And he was very successful as a newspaper man, and that paper became so successful that it became competition to the other paper in New Hampshire or in Man Manchester, the Manchester Union. And ultimately, the two papers combined under Knox's directorship and ownership. So that was the creation of the Manchester Union leader. Knox went on to run for governor of New Hampshire unsuccessfully. He went on to be the vice presidential candidate with Alf Landon in the, uh, the presidential election of, what would that be, I think, 36. Um, and then he was appointed by the, uh, Fr Franklin Roosevelt to be the Secretary of the Navy. And uh, he was Secretary of the Navy for, during World War II, and he died in 1943. And when he died, the newspaper, the union leader, um, became his wife's possession and she was really not interested in running a newspaper and so she sold the newspaper to a guy named William Loeb and that was how William Loeb came to own the newspaper. All right we're going to dump out of the share your screen here. Stop share your screen. Now I'm on the screen we see everybody although you're in little black boxes here but at any rate um, so as I said the primary was that you didn't elect presidential candidates you elected delegates to the convention. And after that went on for several years, in 19, after the 1948 
um, primary, people start saying, well, this is kind of a useless exercise. Why are we doing this? Why don't we have presidential candidates? Why are their names on the ballot? And there was a move to change that reality. And that move uh, kind of took, took hold with a man named Richard Upton. And I don't know if any of you have heard of Richard Upton. Upton, he was an attorney here in Concord and that time fairly early in his career. And he was elected to the New Hampshire State House. Um, and I'm gonna just do a little bit of adjusting here. And we're now gonna show, and I, I guess I didn't say at the beginning, this, this talk is me talking, but it's also clips from the documentary. Um, so that I, you don't have to listen to just me talk, you get to hear me uh, shut up and we look at some of the clips. And this is the first clip. And this is, a, it starts off with Richard Upton. And as you'll see, Richard Upton is really the man that we owe a debt of gratitude for creating the presidential primary. So let me have just a second here. Line it up, share screen. There's Richard Upton on my screen. All right, you should see Richard Upton in the still form, and I'm gonna full screen him. Oh, not what I want. Is that full screen? Do you see him up full? Let me move it back, and we will start with Richard Upton. All right. The volume's a little low. That better? I'm still not hearing him. You're not hearing him. No. Oh, I know. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I know what I did. Stop share. Thank you. Thank you for your patience here while I zip through this. There was a button I forgot to push. All right. Let's try it again. Share screen. Uh, all right, we're back to me. Now we're going to go here, and I have to say share computer audio. Now we should hear it. All right, we'll make it full screen in a second. So uh, in the 1949 now? legislature, when I was elected speaker, fortunately, um, I saw to it that a bill was introduced. I didn't, at that time, feel that the speaker should introduce a bill under his own name. So I had a friend of mine, uh, Reuben Moore of Bradford, sponsor the bills. He agreed with me about it. And I wrote the bills out on one weekend, some of it on the back of an envelope. Richard Upton's bill did essentially two things. First, it put the names of presidential candidates on the ballot in a preference poll or beauty contest. Secondly, it allowed for the inclusion of a candidate's name on the ballot by petition with 100 signatures, unless a candidate specifically asked not to be on the ballot. I guess the idea is to force the presidential candidates into the field whether they want to or not. The bill passed both houses of the legislature with voice votes and full support of both Democratic and Republican leadership. On May 11, 1949, Governor Sherman Adams signed the bill creating the New Hampshire presidential preference primary. He wasn't too sure uh, that uh, he ought to sign it. I, uh, I went in and he called me in and said, what does this bill mean? And uh, we went, uh, went over the possible consequences. I think we discussed uh, how it might impact on uh, various upcoming candidates. Um, I gave it as my opinion that um, it would quicken the interest of the voters, that there would be a real, I, hope, I hoped, a real lively contest, and that our state would be put on the map. Okay, did you hear it all right, I assume? Yep. Yeah, good, okay. So, um, Richard Upton, I just have to share something about him in terms of his modesty and how politicians are different today than they were years ago. So I did that interview with him in 1986. And what would that be? That was over 30 years we had the primary and certainly the primary had evolved and was more than what it was when he started it. That was really the first time he ever sat down and did an interview 
about his role in the creation of the New Hampshire presidential primary. He was not somebody that went out and bragged about it a lot. At any rate, as you can see, he's, uh, but without him, it would not exist. Very clearly, it would not have changed. So let's look at the two changes that he made. Is they're important. First of all, that idea that he could put the candidates' names on the ballot as a preferential, as a, as a beauty contest, because that's all it was, was a beauty contest. There was absolutely zero connection between the delegates going to the convention and how many votes one of those presidential candidates got in the beauty contest. You still voted, all the names of the delegates, potential delegates were still on the ballot, and there was no connection. If, if, if all the Eisenhower delegates didn't get voted in and Eisenhower won the primary, wouldn't have mattered. The delegates wouldn't have gone to the convention. So I, I hope you're being clear about how I'm explaining that. So there was no connection. Second of all, the candidate didn't need to put their name on the ballot. Anybody could take their name and put it on the ballot for them. And the only thing a candidate could do is decide that it, they didn't want their name on the ballot in the first place. So the candidates had the option of saying, no, I don't want to be on it. But they didn't have the option of saying, I think I'm going to put myself on. You didn't. You had a group of people that, you know, your supporters put your name on the ballot. So that was pretty important in terms of the way the 1952 presidential election was playing out. So let's look at that moment in 1952 for a moment. Um, on the Democratic side, Harry Truman was president. And Harry Truman, more importantly, represented the fifth Democratic election that was won by the White House in a row. The Republicans hadn't had a candidate in the White House since Herbert Hoover. So it was over 20, almost 20 years. So it was really, really important for them to finally regain and get control and get a president in the White House who was a Republican. Now, there were some candidates out there that were interested. There was uh, uh, Harold Stassen from Minnesota. There was Robert Taft, who was really the most, the front runner in many ways, but Robert Taft was the son of President William Howard Taft. He was from Ohio, very conservative, known as Mr. Republican. Um, but none of them really seemed to be, you know, we faced that this time around. Who is, you know, who, and, and, you know, it's always the question, is this candidate the right candidate for the moment? We just want somebody perfect, you know? And the perfect candidate was this guy named Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower was the hero of the world. He had been, you know, as you know, the commander of uh, Allied forces in World War II. At that moment in time, he was serving in NATO. And he saw himself really above politics. He was not interested in politics. But politics was interested in him. Both the Democrats and the Republicans tried to get Dwight Eisenhower to be their candidate for president. And finally, um, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge flew over to Europe and had a meeting with Eisenhower. He got Eisenhower to say that, well, if he was going to run for president, he would be a Republican. He voted Republican. Lodge came back to the United States, had a press conference to announce that Eisenhower is a Republican and therefore he could be on the Republican ballot. And Sherman Adams, the governor of New Hampshire at the time, started leading a group and they put Eisenhower's name on the ballot. And all Eisen, but Eisenhower would never have put his name on the ballot himself. And even the act of taking his name off the ballot, which was his option, was a little bit below his dignity. He was better than that. He, he didn't see himself as a political person. And so for him, it was many ways the perfect setup. Somebody could run a campaign for him and he could join into it later. Um, so that would be the Republican side. The Democratic side, which is where the next video clip is going to come from, was also interesting. Now, in New Hampshire, the Democratic Party in 1952 was not a very strong thing. As you'll see in the clip, the, the Democratic Party um, hadn't won an election in New Hampshire in many years. And part of that, when part of that was related to our senator at the time, the US Senator Stiles Bridges, who had been elected to the Senate in 1934. And during Stiles Bridges' lifetime in the Senate, no Democrat was elected to a statewide office, period. 
Um, Stiles Bridges really controlled the Republican Party. He built it. We were already a Republican state, but he had a pretty good grip and, and ran it and was very successful. So on the Democratic side, you had Harry Truman, and nobody really knew if Harry Truman was going to run for re-election or not. So people were just kind of, a lot of people were just sitting back, Truman's going to run, Truman's going to run. Um, but then there were some people that thought maybe he wouldn't. And one of those was a man, a senator from uh, Tennessee by the name of Estes Kefauver. Kefauver was thinking that Truman was not going to run, and he wanted to put himself in position to be the candidate. Well, if Truman's not going to run, Kefauver is doing pretty good. Maybe we should look to Kefauver. And so he wanted, he, and he saw this New Hampshire primary thing, kind of a new thing. Maybe he could come up here and work the primary and, 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 and give a little, build his reputation a little bit more, show he was capable of getting votes. He didn't expect to win. He just came up here to, to show that he could win an election uh, and, and maybe put himself in the running for president. So with that said, we're going to run to the next clip. And this is about the Democratic side of the 1952 New Hampshire primary. And I'm going to share that right there. That's a share. Hope you all see it. Tell me if you don't. And now we'll play it. I, I couldn't find any Democrats. And there was a little general store there. And the man kicked me out of the store when he heard that I was a Democrat. He said, we we don't have any Democrats and we don't allow them to stay here very long. Get. In 1952, New Hampshire Democrats were at best fragmented, at worst a token opposition party that some believed was even run by Republicans. They hadn't held a major statewide office in over 15 years, but the primary would open state Democrats to a new world of politics and it would be a Democratic candidate who sparked the style of campaigning that has become the mark of the New Hampshire primary. What did the mayor say? He thanked me, that was about all. How long were you there? Not more than 10 minutes. As chairman of the Senate Special Committee to investigate interstate crime, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver became the nation's first political television star. The investigation marked the first live national television coverage of a congressional hearing, and Americans from California to New Hampshire were tuning in. Believing that Harry Truman would not seek another term in office, Kefauver wanted to establish himself as a viable Democratic candidate for president, and he looked to the New Hampshire primary as the vehicle to do it. Well, uh, I was sitting quietly in the office one day and minding my own business, and a very strong conservative in Laconia called me up and says, Tom, he said, you know, Esther Kefauver's coming up here to the tavern to campaign next Sunday? I said, no. Well, he says, I think it's your duty as former Democratic mayor to go down and meet him. So I said, well, all right, maybe I should. So Myrtle and I went down. Kevauver was the first Democratic senator that many in New Hampshire had ever seen. He was an anomaly, a Democrat who thought himself a winner. Though many owed their loyalties to the president, Kevauver quickly gained supporters, especially among women, many of whom had seen him on television during his committee hearings. We all stood around the little knot. Hugh Bounds was there, and Bernie Booten was there, I was there and uh, so was Myrtle. And uh, what happened was that uh, he said, well, now, Tom, you're going to help me be my chairman. I said, I can't be your chairman. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the county chairman. He looked around at Huey Bounds and says, Hugh, you're going to help me? And I said, Hugh, you can't help him. You're the city chairman. By that time, all of a sudden, there was this little voice from the back of the, of the, of the group. He said, Senator, I'll help you. It was Mrs. Mack. <laughs> He said, Madam Chairman. <laughs> he got this little boy hurt look on his face. Everybody was turning him down. And I thought, gee, this man comes, he's, uh, he's a senator, nobody will help him. They're crazy. I said, Senator, I'll help you. It was just on impulse. Because the fact was, I was a registered Republican. Kevauver brought a new style of campaigning to New Hampshire. It was personal, sometimes gimmicky. But voters liked it, and it made good copy for the national press covering the primary. You know, he'd just go up the street with his big hand, and he was, he was a big man. And, you know, just very casually, well, my name is Estes Kefauver, I'd like your help, and move right on. And they had a system that was, the, the, the Washington staff behind him was a gal getting your name, and then went a letter. We'd never seen anything like this. 
and Estes would put on any kind of a hat. I'm not sure that was the best thing in the world, but he would. And he would he got into everything there was. It was a if we had a toboggan, he would ride in the toboggan. If there was a nice skater or something, he'd try to skate with him. And uh, every kind of a gadget we found an old fire truck, I think it was, <clears throat> down in uh, in Hooksett, and that was all rigged up with lights. And we run it up and down the street in Manchester at night, and Estes were along there, tailing along with him, shaking hands with everybody they could find. Once he started it, everyone had to do it. And the people expected to be courted in that way. The, in the old times, if you wanted to carry a community, you went to see five or six or four or five of the leaders, and sometimes fewer number. And if you could sell yourself to them, they would get out the vote in the town for, your, for you. But uh, that isn't true anymore. So Estes Kiefer really set the tone, and that tone lives in the primary to this day, that idea of getting out and being personal and going out and shaking hands. And you listen to Myrtle McIntyre talking there, you know, they have the staff and they get your name and then they came a letter. Those were all things that Estes Kiefer put in place and experimented with here in New Hampshire. Now on a personal side, I have to, I always like to tell the story about the interviews. You know, I did all the interviews for this. And when we went to do the interviews with the McIntyres, actually we were only going to interview Tom. Myrtle was not on the list. But as we were setting up, she was kind of pacing around in the background and it was clear that she was itching to say something. And so at the last minute, we invited her to sit down and said, would you like to join us in the interview? And boom, she was there. Um, and she really gave a whole new life and different direction in many ways to the interview with, uh, with Tom, as you'll see later in the next clip that we show. Anyway, so what happened? We know Eisenhower won on the, Demo on the Republican side, but on the Democratic side, Estes Kefauver won. He beat Harry Truman. And that really surprised a lot of people, it surprised Harry Truman. Um, and two weeks later, Harry Truman decided that he would make an announcement that he was not going to run for president again. Now, maybe he was going to make that announcement anyways. Maybe it was always in his plan. But Estes Kefauver beating him in the New Hampshire primary put a shadow over that that changed how people perceived it. And that was looked at in a couple of ways. First of all, the New Hampshire or the Washington establishment was not happy with Estes Kefauver for, for what he did. As, as the McIntyres would say, they weren't happy for him for running over the old man um, and the embarrassment that that brought to, to Harry Truman. Um, and as, as a result of that, Estes Kefauver really became a pariah in the Democratic Party at the 1952 political uh, Democratic Convention. Um, but in the end, the Democrats nominated Adlai Stevenson, and in the end, Dwight D. Eisenhower won the presidential primary, or I'm sorry, won the, the general election in November. Now, let's look at that 1952 a little bit more, because that's part of why New Hampshire got traction, as they say. You know, first of all, we had these new technologies coming around. One of them was air travel, so that Reporters in Washington can get on an airplane in the morning and have lunch in New Hampshire and start following Estes Kefauver around or, or following some of the Republicans. Robert Taft ultimately came to New Hampshire and campaigned and Harold Stassen was here campaigning. So they could come up here and they could get the story. We were accessible in a way that years earlier was just not possible. And then we're really a pretty state. You know, we're, a, we're, we're the ideal of what America is all about, these country farmers. And 1952 was the height of the Cold War. And we became part of what selling America was all about. We became the state. We were the little place here where all the farmers are sitting around their, 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 their uh, corner store playing checkers and talking presidential politics. And they're gonna make the decision on who's gonna be the leader of the free world. Now that's democracy. You didn't see that in Red China. You didn't see that in Russia. We became part of the cell of what makes America great. The very first cover about the New Hampshire primary on a national magazine wasn't a candidate. It was a farmer in front of his farm. Um, so this whole idea of what American democracy is all about was represented by the very fact of the way New Hampshire primary was conducted. 
So the next clip I'm going to show kind of explains that or, or will, will demonstrate that to you in a very interesting way. This clip is a, a, is a universal newsreel that came out after the New Hampshire primary. And listen to those themes in the verbiage of this, of this clip. All right, take it away. Share here, share here, and share here. <laughs> Primary elections in New Hampshire for delegates to the Democratic and Republican National Conventions find candidates and campaign managers pulling no punches. Everyone is in there pitching in an endeavor to gauge the mood of the American people. This is the first real popularity test for the favorites, and Senator Robert A. Taft comes to New Hampshire to make his bid. Lee Stassen hopes for another opportunity to corral the Republican nomination. The citizens of the Granite State are not easily won. The country meeting places are hotbeds of political discussion. In village, town, and city, voters brave bitter snow and sleet to cast their votes. Eisenhower, Taft, Stassen, Warren, MacArthur, Truman, Kefauver. It's a free country and no armed guards to restrict your personal opinion. It was the nation's first presidential primary and a record one. And when the ballots were totted up, it was a clean sweep for General Eisenhower on the Republican side and for Senator Estes Kefauver heading the Democratic slate. Hampshire has spoken, and experts are looking for more straws in the political wind. So, as I said, you can really see how we became part of what America is, and that was that was uh, so important to establishing us as a, as, a, as, a, as an important political event. So, we're going to jump ahead. But let's just kind of quickly talk over some of the, the years in between. Uh, 1956, there was really no uh, Republican primary. Uh, Eisenhower was going to be elected. And, but the, the question was, who would be his vice presidential candidate? And it, you know, originally, his vice presidential candidate was Richard Nixon. And there was a slight move, maybe we should drop Richard Nixon. But miraculously, Nixon was saved by the 1956 New Hampshire presidential primary because there was a write-in vote for him to be vice president. And it surprised everybody, even Dwight Eisenhower, so that Nixon was kept on the ballot. And who knows, he probably wouldn't have been kept on the ballot anyways. But at any rate, that was the story of the 1956 primary. Estes Kefauver was here campaigning again and won the primary in 56. But again, the Democrats nominated Adlai Stevenson to run for a second time against Dwight Eisenhower, but they did let they did make a, a an amend with with Estes Kefauver, and Estes Kefauver was the vice presidential candidate in 1956. There was another guy that was looking to get elected president, and he actually tried to make a bid to be the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic side in 56, and that was John Kennedy. John Kennedy, you know, senator from Massachusetts saw this primary about how it played for Estes, how it played for Eisenhower, and he realized that if he could win the New Hampshire primary, it was probably gonna help him in his bid to become president. And so in 1956, Kennedy started talking to the Democratic people up here in New Hampshire and started building the Democratic Party because he realized that in order for him to do what he wanted to do, he needed a strong Democratic Party in New Hampshire. And kind of built on what Estes Kefauver, Estes Kefauver came in and said to these people like the McIntyres, you know, you can do it, you're Democrats, you, you, know, you, you can do this, you can, you, can, you, can, you can win elections if you work at it. And Ke uh, Kennedy came in and took those same people and said, let's take another step, let's make this party strong. And so he built the Democratic Party actually to help his presidential campaign. And sure enough, in 1960, he won the New Hampshire primary, 
there was really very little competition because all the other candidates looked at New Hampshire and saw the closeness and saw what Kennedy was doing and they didn't even bother to try. So that the, the primary was all his and the same happened for Richard Nixon. You know, Nixon had these friends from 56 that made him vice president. And in 1960, again, there was nobody who was gonna challenge Richard Nixon in the New Hampshire primary, even though there were other candidates. And there was this theory, well, we'll take him out later down the road, but it never happened. So Kennedy went on to be elected president. Um, 64 um, was right after President Kennedy was assassinated. And there was no Democratic primary in 1964. It's the only time in the history of the New Hampshire primary that there was no name on the ballot for one of the political parties. Um, on the Republican side, you had Barry Goldwater and Nelson Rockefeller, the two extreme wings of the Republican Party, Barry Goldwater, the conservative wing, and, and, and Rockefeller, the, the moderate uh, liberal wing of the Republican Party. And neither one of them was doing very well. And then somebody started a write-in vote for Henry Cabot Lodge, and Lodge won the write-in vote. But it was all really kind of a meaningless exercise because in 1964, everybody knew Lyndon Johnson was going to get re-elected president. So that moves us on to 1968. And 1968 was a pivotal year for the New Hampshire primary um, in a couple of ways. But first of all, let's look at that moment in time again. What was the most important issue on everybody's mind in 1968? See, you're all muted. I see you all shaking your heads. No, I'm just kidding. It was the Vietnam War. And you know, Lynn, people were not happy with Lyndon Johnson's handling of the Vietnam War. And ultimately, this candidate named Gene McCarthy uh, put himself out there to make a statement against the Vietnam War by running against, as a peace candidate in the New Hampshire primary against Lyndon Johnson. And so that's the story of the next video clip that we're gonna look at is that campaign on the Democratic side in 1968. So let's see if I can do this with You almost knew it was futile, but the statement had to be made about the war. But I think for many, many people, it was not the man who wants to be president, but an issue that people were increasingly concerned about. And he's the one who brought it before us. And there were, there were some of the votes were people who felt that the war hadn't been pursued strongly enough or successfully enough. So it was anti-Johnson in that respect. Uh, not exactly peace people, but who felt that the war was a failure. And there were some who thought he was Joe McCarthy. In 68, it, it was very evident to me that one of the things we needed was to revitalize the party. You could see the ragged edges all over the place. Ten years earlier, Bernie Booten had led a new generation of Democrats to control of the state party. Now another generation was about to challenge the status quo and the presidential administration that had brought Democrats to power in the state. So it really was my suggestion to have Senator McIntyre and Governor King as co-chairman of the campaign. They're good friends to begin with, They're our top office holders in New Hampshire. And uh, hopefully this would provide a unifying base. So instead of two teams, maybe they'd be one team. First of all, we were told that we were committing treason by, who? by the senator, our Democratic senator, and the governor, Democratic governor at the and time. And people in the, uh, in the state committee. In the state committee, yeah. that uh, it was, I mean, to the point of treason, mm. and uh, that we would have no political futures whatsoever. And if we had any political ambitions, forget about it. We were committing political suicide. There was a difference between Washington and New Hampshire. And yet, if John King said something, you had to stick by what he said. And that's what got you in trouble, whether you admit it or not. He accused McCarthy of lack of patriotism. And when they asked me this out of the call, I didn't know what the king had said. But I remember saying, oh, I, do, <clears throat> I don't think that's fair. I don't think that for regardless of McCarthy and what he's saying, that he isn't still a patriot in, in every sense of the word. And that got us in trouble immediately because the next, next morning I was down in Hampton somewhere, or down Hampton Beach or something, and we got a call from the gang saying, hey, King's up in arms, 
you contradicted him. And I think that's where I kind of mushed out a little bit. I tried to squeal off it. And it was a, it was a very difficult thing to, uh, to get involved in the last stages of that campaign as far as uh, knocking McCarthy around. It wasn't working. In fact, McCarthy had no competition, for Lyndon Johnson's name wasn't on the ballot. His was a write-in campaign. But both sides were aggressively out to win. The Johnson people blanketed the state with numbered pledge cards for people to sign, while the McCarthy people used radio advertising, movie stars, and busloads of out-of-state college students. Remember the keep clean with Jean? Yes. Yeah. We were a little nervous about the kids who were, the hair was too long or a little too rough looking. So they were put in cellars on telephones. They were marvelous. And writing envelopes and uh, postcards and doing that kind of thing. They were, there was a screening process. They weren't allowed to go out and look. Uh, knock on doors unless they were reasonably shaved and hair cut and spiffed up a little. Whatever they did, they all worked so hard. And I think the thing they were so valuable for was the door-to-door -door campaigning that they did. They went into every possible neighborhood that right. they could. Really. By 1968, personal campaigning in New Hampshire was no longer a novelty. It was expected. While Johnson ignored the state, McCarthy made sure the voters of New Hampshire had a chance to meet him. He was more articulate and, and uh, intelligent uh, than many a politician that I've ever seen, and that appealed to some of us. Uh, to others, that, that was a turnoff. However, he's a very, very gracious, friendly man, and I think anybody that he met personally was mm -hmm. charmed by him. And don't you? Oh, yeah. I think oh, that, yeah. and the fact that he bothered, as I, as I said earlier, to go into funny little places to meet people. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was the actual winner, receiving 49% of the vote. However, McCarthy, who was only supposed to get 10%, ended up with 41% and a decisive moral victory. So, a couple of things were happening there. First of all, McCarthy was really taking a step further the, the lessons that he had learned from Estes Kefauver, personal campaigning and getting out there and being with people and meeting with people. And he also, but he also added bringing in college students from out of state, movie stars. This was something new for the primary. This was a new development that kind of brought attention to the candidate and, and, and helped him win. Um, and as you know, the story is that uh, two weeks later, as in exactly what happened with Harry Truman, two weeks later, Lyndon Johnson took himself out of the race. Because at the moment of the primary, nobody was sure if he was going to, you know, most people thought he was going to run again. So, again, the party establishment with New Hampshire disrupted the flow. We disrupted the flow. And, and people weren't very happy about that. Now, let me just back up a little bit here and talk about one guy in the picture there, and that's Bernie Booten. Um, Bernie, is, Bernie was the one who really ran the Kennedy campaign in 1960. He ran for governor of New Hampshire in 1958 and in 1960, uh, lost both times, but he ran for governor with the express purpose of building up and taking control of the Democratic Party to help John F. Kennedy get elected president. And when Kennedy was elected president, Bernie Booten went to Washington with him. Uh, he tells the story about the day after the election, he got a call from President Kennedy or President-elect Kennedy and said, Bernie, we need you. And Bernie was ultimately chosen to be the administrator for the General Services Administration uh, and a Kennedy man to the very core. Um, Bernie was the man that cleaned out the Oval Office the day after Kennedy was assassinated. As, uh, as head of the General Services Administration, that fell upon him. And when we did the interview with Bernie, right over his shoulder on the, right over his shoulder on the mantle was this big engraving of the White House. And it had written on it to Bernie Booten, who stood by the president from the very beginning to the very end. And it was signed by Jacqueline Kennedy, December of 1963. Um, Bernie was very tied in to the Kennedys. Um, at any rate, 
So people start looking at this New Hampshire primary now, and they're starting to say, these guys are getting some attention here. You know, 56 or 1952, that was kind of a fluke. That was brand new. Okay, we'll let you have that. 56, that was minor. 60, we knew that, that Kennedy and Nixon were going to win. 64, that wasn't meaningless. But 1968, we made this statement. The statement went around the world and around the country in a way that had never happened before. And so people started looking at what was going on in New Hampshire and saying, actually other states, we, we, we weren't a part of that. Why is, why is New Hampshire getting all this stuff? And so before the 1972 primary came along, Florida decided to set their primary to be the same day as New Hampshire. Well, New Hampshire responded by changing the date of town meeting day from the second Tuesday in March to the first Tuesday in March. It was the first date change for the primary or for the town meeting in history. Um, and then the candidates started coming a little earlier. Now we're going to like another clip here. And this clip is really, again, the Democratic side. Sorry, but the Democratic side has more interesting stories than some of the early years. Um, so the two main candidates on the Democratic side for the 1972 primary were Ed Muskie and George McGovern. And both of them worked the state pretty hard. And having said Ed Muskie, the first thing that may come to your minds is He's the guy that cried in front of the union leader. And in terms of iconic moments in the history of the New Hampshire presidential primary, Muskie crying in front of the union leader has to really be at the top of the page. So this next section is about how that came to happen. But more importantly, it takes a look into finally what's, what's, what makes a campaign work. Why do some candidates take off and some don't? What is it that, that what is it that the candidate has to have in order to do really well here in New Hampshire? So, having made that as an introduction, and I also need to mention that um, we did a documentary. I did a documentary a few years ago about the life of William Loeb, and this next clip includes a little portion from the Loeb documentary. So you'll hear a different narrator in there, and that's from the Loeb documentary. All right, how did 1972 transpire? We're going to share it right now. Off we go. The union leader, whether you agreed with us, you hated us, we were the we were a conscience of the state. We still we still were there to say, aha, this guy is a thief, this guy is stealing, take a look at this, take a look at that. You know, there aren't a lot of newspapers that have the guts to go out and crusade. The Manchester Union Leader is New Hampshire's largest and only statewide daily newspaper, a potent force in itself. But it was made all the more powerful by its outspoken conservative publisher, William Loeb. Bill Loeb loved politics. He loved politics as the game of politics. He grew up with politics. Uh, he loved the give and take. He loved the power of politics. They, they provided a lot of the anti-Muskie ammunition, no question about it, no question about it. They just hammered at it every day, every day. Politically, we're at the other end of the spectrum yeah, because, we're, because we were out of what was the liberal mainstream. But that didn't mean that we were bad, it didn't mean that we were evil, it didn't mean that we did one thing different than any other newspaper, any television channel. We just went, we were just looking at it from a different, from a, from a different side of the spectrum. We were looking at it from the right. Everyone else was looking at it from the left. In those days, it was, it was very bad to be a hippie. Uh, and uh, they would go and photograph hippies in front of the Muskie campaign. You know, they, well, I don't know whether it was put up or not. You know, you don't, you don't know. But, but they really did everything they could. I never wrote a word that wasn't true. I never misquoted anyone. Loeb doesn't like Muskie, and Loeb has been told that Muskie has a short fuse, and uh, Loeb is going to see if he can light this fuse. Anti-Muskie editorials in the Union Leader were routine, but in February 1972, the Union Leader printed a letter suggesting that Muskie had used the term Canuck to refer to people of French-Canadian heritage. In Loeb's defense, Loeb ran every letter he got, unless it was clearly libelous. And 
Loeb got a lot of political letters on any subject. And I think part of Loeb's mindset was, wow, this is great. This is great stuff to get musky with. When issues uh, approached, uh, we wrote up San Juan Hill. We didn't just sit around and do nothing about it. And uh, one of his favorite uh, comments would always be, we can be anything, but I'll be damned if we're going to be dull. The letter was followed the next day by an editorial page reprint of an article from Newsweek magazine in which Muskie's wife Jane revealed a more laid-back personality. Ed Muskie's fuse had been lit. On a snowy Saturday morning, ten days before the primary, he held a rally in front of the union leader office. By attacking me, by attacking my wife, he has proved himself to be a gutless coward. I think he lost it. I don't know whether he actually cried, but he obviously got overcome with emotion. Now, why didn't he go to Newsweek in New York and pull his flatbed truck up and have Osborne Elliott come down, you gutless coward, stop picking on my wife. That wasn't going to get him any votes in New Hampshire. He thought he was going to uh, do something to spark his campaign. Instead, it blew up in his face. I called William Loeb. I said, what do you think of this guy? He says, geez, a guy like that gets emotional over a little old newspaper publisher? I don't want a guy like that with his finger on a nuclear button. Oh, yeah. Every time it comes up to this day, when people uh, hear that I worked on the Muskie campaign, the first thing they say is, oh, too bad he cried. He was a good man. Too bad he cried. I've had this. I mean, you know, I had that just the other day. Somebody said that. People still say that. <laughs> but it really wasn't why he lost. Your campaign, from an organizer's point of view, can be perfection but it doesn't move unless the candidate transmits a jolt of electricity to it. Because then people would come during the campaign, I can't tell you how many times, oh, he's not like he was on the TV. And they were comparing the thrill they got, you know, from, from seeing him on the tube cutting Nixon down to size and remembering how excited and thrilled they were. And it, and, uh, it didn't measure up. You know, they were disappointed. But he went to shake hands at the polls. And he went up to this one young woman standing, I think it was Ward 6 in Manchester, as I re remember. And he said, my name is George McGovern. And she said, this is the sixth time I've met you. His wife wouldn't let us schedule him as much as we wanted to. Jane Muskie took care of him. She took care of that man. He had to have a nap, you know, in the middle of the afternoon. And, and uh, the, uh, you know, the other candidates were going 24 hours a day, but Ed was, was uh, having his rest. The New Hampshire primary demonstrated a new phenomenon in 1968. By being an election, a candidate could win by perception rather than actual votes. Perception would also play a role in 1972. Simply receiving the most votes would not be enough for Ed Muskie to be declared the winner. What Muskie was running against was not an arbitrary percentage, but an expectation that as the front runner from a neighboring state, he would do very well here. And if Muskie had run a good campaign here and had fallen a few percentage points short of 50%, I don't think anything much would be, have been made of it. Ed Muskie won New Hampshire. The fact that he got less than 50%, that perception, he, they should have never allowed the perception to go out across the country that he had lost. When Muskie got up to speak that evening, he did not give, he did not accept the mantle of victory the way he should have because they had preconditioned themselves along the lines that they were going to get this unusually high percentage of the vote. And because he got, what did he wind up with, 49.6 or something like that? You know, he won. So much of it is the perception of. In the final count, George McGovern received 35% of the vote to Ed Muskie's 45%. McGovern, who had built his campaign on doing well in New Hampshire, never lost the momentum and went on to be the Democratic nominee in 1972. All right. So, you know, think about that. Ed Muskie is taking naps in the afternoon and George McGovern is out there meeting people six times. You know, that really is a statement about 
what it takes for a candidate and how we in New Hampshire, because we have such personal contact with them, get to know them and get to see them and, and make a statement about them. So, but more importantly about in terms of the history of the primary, 72 was a third time that New Hampshire kind of knocked out the front runner. And now people, not only are they saying, how do we get a piece of that action? They're starting to say, why is New Hampshire even first? What right does New Hampshire have to be first? You know, you guys aren't true representative of the world, of the country. Um, and so people started making this plan to, to have other states come in as primary. Florida tried it again and moved it ahead. Um, and there was a move to have a New England primary for 1976. And New Hampshire's response to the New England primary was to pass a law that said New Hampshire's primary will be held one week earlier than any other state in New England. And that's how we went into 76. Now, I should also say that, you know, for the very first issue, the very first primary, there was that issue about candidates being connected to their delegates. And even in 1968, it was still just a beauty contest. Yes, Lyndon Johnson won. Lyndon Johnson got the most votes, but the people on the McCarthy side really focused on getting votes for their delegates. And McCarthy went to the convention in 68 with most of his New Hampshire delegates were all McCarthy supporters because there was no connection. So that got changed before the 1976 primary, that changed. Um, and also, because those names were still on the ballot, in the 1976 primary, there were over 391 names on the ballot for the 1976 primary, because all of the delegates' names were on there. And that was the last year that that would be the case. Um, anyways, New Hampshire, and then along came before, so we're going to skip over 76, and then people still were wanting to be a part of it, and more states started suggesting that they wanted to be first. And so New Hampshire amended its law to say that we'll be one week earlier than any other election. And that why, that's how the New Hampshire being first became codified in our state's laws. So with that, we move on to the 1980 New Hampshire primary. Um, this is really the last clip. And this is a Republican side for 1980. Um, and there was a moment in the 1980 primary that was the defining moment for that, that year. And that was down in Nashua at a debate. Uh, the primary two front runner candidates were George Bush and Ronald Reagan. And there was a statement made by Ronald Reagan that I paid for this microphone. And so this is the story about how Ronald Reagan came to pay for that microphone. Now, by way of setting it up, I should point out that it was a pretty close race between Bush and, and, and Reagan, and there were several other candidates. There was um, Howard, or Howard Baker, there was Bob Dole was running, there was uh, Phil Crane, there was John Anderson. So there was a pretty big field on the Republican side. Um, but when it came down to things, it was really the two front runners were Reagan and Bush. Now in 1980, the, the Iowa caucuses had started in 76, and in 1980, George Bush won the Iowa caucus. Now, in 1980, the Iowa caucus happened six weeks before the New Hampshire primary. So there was some time to, to make some moves here. And so the Reagan people came into New Hampshire having lost the, uh, the Iowa caucus and ready to turn things around. They had a pretty good ground campaign already, but they needed something more. And so that brings us to the debate. And so here we go with the section about the who paid for this microphone. Uh, at that point, there were only two candidates in the race. It was George Bush and, and, and uh, President Reagan. So that what you really wanted to have, uh, uh, and what I think the National Telegraph saw, and so did I, by the way, and, and so did I, that, that um, the way to clear the air was to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Petition was filed with the Federal Elections Commission. And it was found by the FEC that if we were to do that, it would constitute a campaign contribution to those two candidates. By the National Telegraph? Yeah. 
uh, National Telegraph being a corporation, it would be an illegal campaign contribution. So we called up the, uh, the uh, Bush people and told them, look, uh, uh, we want the debate. Uh, uh, we think it ought to go forward. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we split half of it? Why don't we split it and put it on? We'll each pay half. And um, the answer back for them was that um, um, they didn't want to split it. They didn't want to pay for it. Because the challenge had come from the Reagan people, and I think it was just a little gamesmanship, I suppose. You, know, you pay for it, you challenge us. So we decided, I, I happened to be fortunate at the time, I had uh, Angela Buchanan, who was the treasurer for the campaign, who had come into town for the election. The election was going to be now the following Tuesday, I guess. And uh, she was sitting there, and I said, uh, Bay, uh, let's go for it. And she said, and she was all for it, and, and uh, we wrote the check, and uh, the debate went on. During the day, I remember talking with John Breen at the Telegraph and saying, John, I want to know whether or not the other candidates are going to be participating or not participating. And he said, the understanding is clear. There are going to be no other candidates, just the president. Uh, just Ronald Reagan and George Bush. I said, fine, we're willing to play by any rules that are agreed to, but we want to know what they are, and if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. But the question of who was going to be in the debate and who wasn't became so fluid over that weekend, uh, I don't think anyone quite knew. In fact, the, the, at one point, the, the decision was trying to be made whether, uh, if the rest couldn't go on, whether Ronald Reagan would go on. It was perceived as uh, the Bush people just standing back and saying nothing. It wasn't really true. Uh, they, they were willing to concede opening it up to all the other candidates. Uh, it was a telegraph's decision not to open it up. In the middle of, this, in the middle of discussions, while we're still trying to negotiate to get everybody on the st stadium, on, on the stage, and we're, still, and we're still trying to negotiate to open it up to all the candidates, but George Bush m marches up in, through the door and up to the stage and sits there alone. Now, that's my memory, and, and then there's sort of a pause, and, and, and people are wondering, I think, and, and, uh, and no one quite knows what's going to happen next. Is Ronald Reagan going to go up on that stage or not? Are the other candidates going to go up on that stage or not? To have all seven of them there at once was, I think, uh, not coincidence. When did you uh, know or finally accept the fact that all seven were going to come out on that stage? When they walked past me onto the stage. The first I knew that they were going to be on the stage was when I, I saw them coming out on the stage. Uh, someone asked, someone did ask me if chairs were going to be provided, and I said no. They don't. The fireworks begin. President Reagan wanted to make an, an opening statement. It was, the statement was not provided for in the format. To make an announcement the, with the sound man, please turn Mr. Reagan's mic off. And then. Is this on? Yes. Mr. Green, you turn on my you ask for me if you would, I am paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. You see, we would have won New, uh, uh, New Hampshire with, without this debate. And we would have won it, I think, by a decent margin, but not a big margin. So that George Bush would have still done very well in New Hampshire. The national debate was really national in its impact more than even New Hampshire. It took that Reagan victory in New Hampshire and just made it, it gave a tremendous national impact. That's the significance of the debate, much more so than its impact on New Hampshire. It, it just demolished the, the Bush campaign. So there you have it. You know, it's, it's kind of a meaningless statement. I am paying for this microphone. But it was him taking control. And, and if you noticed that you could see George Bush was really looking uncomfortable. And, and so it, it, it sent out two messages. It sent out that Ronald Reagan was a guy that could take control. And it sent out a message that George Bush was not. And, and that was really kind of the end of the Bush campaign in so many ways. Um, so anyway, that brings us to the end of the video clips. I throw it out if anybody has any questions before I do a little wrap up here. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and throw anything out. 
Um, also, if you'd like, you could always uh, put a question into the chat and I could read it out loud. Okay, there you go. Um, so the question is always, why are we first? Why shouldn't we let other states do it? And you know, this really, you've seen that, that it wasn't anything we seized. We didn't kind of pass this legislation and say, we're claiming this moment in time. It just happened. It happened because Indiana and Minnesota decided to change their rules. It just happened that we did this and it came along and it worked and it worked in New Hampshire in a way that was totally unexpected. So it wasn't that, that we were staking ground that belonged to somebody else. It was that, that we just kind of created this thing. And yes, there's been people of, of states that have challenged it. You know, we've had other challenges. 84, um, again, we knocked out the front runner. The front runner was supposed to be Walter Mondale and along came this guy named Gary Hart and beat him in the primary. And so again, the party establishment was really angry with New Hampshire. Um, and there have been other challenges, and, and, and we still have that law that says we will be first. And therefore, in 2008, you may remember, um, the primary was held the first weekend in January. So we've gotten pretty early. Um, this past year, this year was back in normal space, back in February. But it, it's moved around, and it's moved around as other people have tried to challenge. You know, and at one point, the Republic or the, the, the Democratic Party even created a window and, and we decided, no, we're not gonna, that window doesn't, doesn't fit in with our plan. It's still, we need to be a week earlier. And we ignored the window and had the primary anyways and ultimately our delegates were seated. So we have a pretty strong reputation and at this point in time, I, I'm not sure what would ever change that. Um, I think that if something's gonna change to knock us away from first, I think it's probably, going to be some sort of technology that we don't really know about yet. So with that, and if there's no other questions, I'll say congratulations on getting through it. <laughs> I actually have a quick question about Dixville Notch. Um, yep. That is an incredibly small town and there was a, um, a little bit of controversy this year that they might not almost be the first technical primary. Could you expand on why or how long and also how long has Dixville Notch been the technically the, the first town to have the primary? Well, the first town was actually that used to do that was Hart's Location. Mm -hmm. And then Dixville Notch conscientiously tried to usurp them from that and was successful in it. First of all, understand how that happens. The way it happens is because there's just 26 voters in Dixville Notch. They all work at the Balsons. Uh, they all live on the grounds of the Balsons. Okay. Um, but most importantly, is they all vote at midnight. And so because everybody votes, they can close the polls. Uh, if one person said, no, I'm not gonna vote, they wouldn't be able to do that. And so there, and, and, and you know, I was actually up there one year for the, for the vote and every person has their own voting booth. So at midnight, the ballots are handed, everybody goes into the ballot, into their own booth and everybody comes out and, and the ballots go in and they're counted um, because and because everybody's voted, they can close the polls and do that. And so that's the that's the the practical fact of how that happens. Um, but as you also know, the Balsams has been closed now for ten years, and and so there is not much of a population in Dixville Notch. I think they did do it this year, but Hart's location is also trying to take it back. Um, so I don't know where that's playing out right at the moment, but I, I know that's the, that's that's how it happens. Okay, because I always thought it was some sort of a novelty, um, a novelty thing. Because I thought I'm like a town that actually has only twenty something people. Is that even? I think that's what some people said. Is like, is this even? I think that's where the controversy came from. The idea of like, does this technically even qualify as a town anymore? Well, certainly it is a novelty. Um, but it's not unusual uh, to have a t small town in New Hampshire, you know, yes. If, and it's not really a town, it's, it's a, just a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, it's just a location, you know, Dixville Notch, it's a pretty small little area up there. But it, it was pretty, it was a lot of fun to be up there on the night of the primary. In fact, what year was it? It was 2004 when I was up there and um, Wesley Powell, is it Wesley Powell? No, Wesley oh, Clark. Clark. Yeah, 
Yeah, he came up and he shook everybody's hand before the vote and then he left. But before he got in the car and left, they had voted and he won. <laughs> so, so they ran out to the car and got him before he pulled out and he came back upstairs and thanked everybody. And there was like a, a, a little victory party and the room was just packed with reporters, just packed. So awesome. anyway. Um, any other questions? Silence. <laughs> Well, that means it was a good program. Uh, someone did have to leave early, but they said incredibly informative and well done. So oh. uh, thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for coming and thank you for hosting us. All right, with that, I'm gonna say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.